All right. This morning, I'm, uh, I'm going to kind of spin off of uh, a couple of messages that Pastor Justin and Steve have recently uh, spoken in our, in our midst. Uh, it's things that God has put on my heart for a long time. So when they actually both spoke recently, I thought, man, that's setting me up great. So thank you guys for the setup. It makes things really easy. But I want to remind you of a few things. And before I do, uh, I'm just going to tell you, the title of today's message is On Being Offended. <laughs> so let's just practice something real quick. Curl up your toes and your shoes. Let them out. Curl them up again. Let them out. Do it one more time. All right. Because you're going to have to curl your toes up today a little bit, okay? But this is not meant to stomp on your toes so I can hurt you and leave here you know, laughing at you or anything like that. It's for us to understand the what it is to be offended and what we're to do about this. I have had this on my heart. I've had it in my notes in my phone for several months now. And uh, I had planned on preaching on this literally a month or so ago. And uh, then these guys preached what's on their heart and God's obviously got a flow to this, amen? So one of the things we'll talk about, like uh, I know that Steve was saying the other day that uh, we gotta have the grace to forgive. We do have to have the grace. If you have a hard time forgiving people, what should you ask God for? The, the grace to do it, the grace to forgive. You know, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain. You want it? You got to sow it. That's it. You reap what you sow. You don't sow. Mer- if you sow um, all the bad stuff, the envy, the strife, the bitter, the discontent, the grudge, you're going to get that back. It's a principle of the kingdom. All right. If you want to grow green beans, you don't sow corn in the ground. That's just silly. We all know that, right? You reap what you sow. It's a principle. It's in nature. It's in the kingdom. Amen. Again, forgiveness. Offense leads to isolation. Pastor Justin, I think, was sharing that just last week. And that's one of the things that I see so much, the need for community, that we cannot allow ourselves to find ourselves in a place where we're an island standing by ourselves. We have to be in community. It's so important. Don't forsake the assembling together of the body of Christ or the believers, amen? It's so important. What we're doing here this morning is important. Well, me and Jesus, we have church on the golf course on Sunday mornings. I mean, all right, well, are you forsaking the assembling of the believers? And the answer is probably yes, you are, all right? There's something important about all of us coming into community together because one of the other things that it provides for you is iron sharpening iron, and we need each other. And sometimes we need each other to rub each other the wrong way. Sometimes we need that as a test. And if we get offended easily, what happens is we go into isolation. When we're in isolation, you're easy pickings. I think you used the analogy last week, didn't you, about the African safari, right? It's the wildebeest that runs out here alone, isolates himself, or gets separated from the pack that is easily picked off. Listen, don't be isolating yourselves, okay? Don't be easy pickings for the devil, all right? Easy casualties when we're not in community. That's what happens. And so we also talk about uh, unforgiveness and what unforgiveness leads to is bitterness or described as the gall of bitterness in the book of Acts, right? Or the root of bitterness. When you harbor unforgiveness or a grudge in your heart, it leads to a place of bitterness and you have a bitter heart and everything that you do is bitter. Everything, everything Everything that you're saying out there is bitter and people pick up on your bitterness. That ought not be in the heart of any believer. People ought not pick up on a spirit of bitterness in anybody in this room. Would you agree with that? I know that's a perfect statement, but it's true, amen? And so it's a nasty, nasty root. And we know how it is with weeds. If you don't pull them out by the root, they're just gonna come back quickly. So it's, it's important, you know, when you're going out there and you pull a thistle out and you think you got it by the root and then it breaks off. It's so frustrating. <laughs> Number one, it's not satisfying because you pull it all out by the roots, you see this long dangling root, you're like, yeah. Gotcha, sucker, right? I mean, seriously, there's something really, really satisfying about pulling out a a thistle or a weed and you get all the roots and you see it and you're like, I got you, man. But when it breaks off and you look down, you see the hole down there an inch or two down and you see that it's still deeply rooted in there, you know you got work to do later. It's coming back and it's not gonna take very long, amen? Amen. We got to dig that nasty root out. In Matthew chapter six, you don't need to turn there. But after the Lord's prayer, we say this so many times. We talk about, we all know the Lord's prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those or the same way that we forgive others. Said this so many times here. 
Do you wanna be forgiven the way that you're forgiving others? Because that's what that means. The way that I forgive is how I want to be forgiven. If you forgive with a grudge, that's what you're asking God for then. Then he reiterates after saying amen, one part of that prayer and it's forgiveness, forgiveness. For if you forgive men their trespasses, he'll forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses against you, finish it. Neither will the Father forgive you. You know that, all right, good. We know our Bible. But are we living it? Are we living it? It has been, uh, in fact, I don't even know, I couldn't even find it on my shelf. Um, years and years ago, I, mean, I don't know how long, 20 some years ago probably, John Bevere wrote a book, one of his first books, The Bait of Satan. And I'm sure some of you have read that. And, uh, and I told the story when I was away by myself, uh, kind of a Christian retreat place south of here. And I uh, was just praying and walking through this house and I saw a bookshelf. I thought, oh, well, I'm praying. I just kind of look at the book titles. And one of the book titles was The Bait of Satan. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's about being offended. I'm not offended. I put the book back on the shelf and I heard the Holy Spirit say, oh, really? <laughs> Man, when the Holy Spirit says, oh, really, you're in trouble. The rest of the conversation is not gonna go well for you. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I forget. I really argue with God. I literally argue with God. No, really, I don't have, I'm, I'm not offended with anybody. I don't have anything in my heart. And then bam, like four or five people's faces came before me. And I thought that I had forgiven, but I forgave them with the grudge. Because like, no, I forgave them, I forgave them that, yeah, but you know what? <laughs> I forgave them, but I, I still don't like them that much. <laughs> so he took me to the woodshed and I understood that and, uh, and God does it sometimes. But that bait of Satan, it's a trap. It, it's to trap Christians, why? To hinder your spiritual growth. Because when you are offended, it can lead to bitterness, unforgiveness and the breakdown of all the relationships in your life. It's a trap, it's a bait that Satan tries to put out in front of us. When, it, when you allow yourself, and I say that again, when you allow yourself to be offended because you can disallow yourself, amen? You have the power to be offended or not be offended. But when you allow yourself to be offended, you inadvertently fall into this very trap the devil sets for you. You're not trying to fall into a trap. Nobody wants to fall into a trap. Even when we see the trap, we don't wanna step in the trap, but sometimes we forget that the trap is there right? Sometimes you forget that it's there and you step back and you hear the snap of the trap. And what it is, is you're offended in your heart towards somebody and the devil now has you where he wants you. Amen. And so again, one of the things I believe, I think Steve, you said this the other day, offenses should be a stepping stone instead of a stumbling block. I loved it. And it's on that statement that I want to go forward and build on that statement and talk about some of the things that we see in scripture regarding this. I wanna remind you of all the offenses that, that we see in scripture, not all of them. I'm just gonna tap on a couple. I won't even go into them. I'm just gonna remind you what they are. Remember all the, the offenses the disciples had both before and after the cross? Both. They were offended of each other multiple times. I think of the sons of thunder, James and John, their mom coming and asking if they can have the right and left hand of God when they come into the kingdom. All the other disciples were like, that's a great question. I love it, love it. Good for you guys. No, they were not. They were what? Jealous and offended. They were jealous and offended that anybody would even ask for that. Do you think maybe some of them thought the same thing already? But they didn't have the courage to ask or at least go have their mama ask because that's what happened, amen? <laughs> they were arguing the very night they had the, the last supper together, they were arguing with each other who was the greatest amongst them. I mean, after three and a half years of ministry, this is what it boils down to. I'm better than you are. Jesus, he's betrayed already. He's about to go before a kangaroo court, be condemned to die and suffer on a cross for all mankind, including these guys that he'd walked with, taught how to be good, faithful stewards of the kingdom. And all they can talk about this night is who's greatest among us. Opportunity for offenses everywhere, amen? Go ahead and turn to John chapter 20. We'll just look at one of these examples. In John 20, and I know we've been here before, this is after he rises from the grave, this is after he reveals himself to Mary at the tomb. And uh, then he appears to them. And we'll, we'll start in verse, uh, well, verse 20, kind of like verse nine, very end of verse 19. When Jesus comes into their midst, he says, peace be with you. Verse 20, 
And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and he showed them his side. The disciples were glad they saw the Lord. So he says, peace be with you, right? So Jesus again says to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. The first two declarations he makes to his disciples on appearing to them in this room is, peace be with you. Why do you think he had to say, peace be with you? Because there was a lack of peace in the presence. Because they had a lack of peace. They did not have the peace that passed all understanding at that moment. They were barely keeping it together. They, were not getting, they weren't getting along before the cross. You think they're getting along after the cross? After their fearless leader has been taken down before their eyes? Do you think they're getting, a be, getting along better now? Oh, no. And then he goes, receive the Holy Spirit. You know what we've taught here many times? This is obviously not the indwelling of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we see in Acts chapter two. It cannot be that because there's a very marked difference between the disciples before Pentecost and after. No question about it, amen? But he gives them some kind of a, a down payment, an earnest payment of the Holy Spirit. And I believe in my heart enough just so you guys can get along and stay in the same room long enough until the Holy Spirit comes <laughs> on day 50. He's gonna be with them for 40 days, Right? He comes back for 40 days. They only got to get along together for like a week, a little over a week. That's it. Yeah, you need something. <sighs> you need that much at least. Seriously. Because they were so easily offended with one another. It happened all the time. That's just a couple of stories that we see right there. Turn to Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew 26, we see the story of the woman breaking the alabaster box. And we'll, we'll start in uh, verse 6. And when Jesus was at Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask, a very costly fragrant oil. She poured it on his head as he sat at the table. Now listen, we know from John chapter 12, I believe it is, that this is Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. So we know who this woman is. Doesn't say it in this passage, but we know it is, it says it that in, in John, okay? So moving on, it says, but when his disciples saw it, they were indignant saying, why this waste? In other words, the word indignant. What else can we put in there? Offended. Right? I'm trying to clue you guys. It's really easy, okay? The word today is offended, all right? All right, so if I ask a question, probably the answer is gonna be offense or offended, okay? So when his disciples saw it, they were indignant. They were upset. They were offended. This fragrant oil should have been sold for much money and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said, why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a good work for me. You have the poor with you always, but you don't always have me. For in pouring this fragrant oil out of my body, she did it for my burial. By the way, he was cluing them in all the time. Do you know that he actually smelled of that oil when he was whipped and beaten? Do you know that he smelled of that fragrant oil? It was still in his skin and in his pores that when he was hanging on the cross, Jesus smelled real good because he had that oil poured all over him already. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the world, this woman, what she has done will be told as a memorial. They were offended. And here's the kicker. It wasn't even theirs. It wasn't even their stuff. It wasn't even their money. It wasn't even their oil. They were offended how somebody else spent their money. Wow, we're so easily offended. We're so easily offended. It's not even theirs. Don't tell me how to spend my money. And I won't tell you how to spend all your money, right? If you want to go buy something on Amazon, fine, right? I just got to make sure I watch that for my own family's sake, amen? <laughs> Slow it down, right? If you want, listen, you want to go buy a car, go buy a car. If you feel like God's telling you to go buy a car, go buy a car. But we don't have the right to tell everybody what, you know, what kind of food you should eat and spend your money on all that kind of stuff. Listen, we talk about good stewardship, but you just, you can't get offended if somebody decides they're gonna spend something extravagant or take an extravagant vacation. Oh, that's being a bad steward. They were accusing her of bad stewardship. And Jesus said, what she's doing is eternal. What she's doing is special. You have no idea. She was compelled by God, by the Holy Spirit to do what she did this day. And all they could see was cha-ching, money. So don't let money be the center of your offense, amen? So easy to let money be that thing, right? And then look at verse 14. So offended that, look, verse 14, it says, then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest. Judas was so offended, he made a deal for 30 pieces of silver. This was 
the straw that broke the camel's back for Judas. I know his heart was already taken with money and things, but this was the final offense of Judas. He was so offended, he went and sold Jesus out because he allowed a woman to bless him and anoint him with oil. And he thought that should have been sold for money. Wow, it's incredible. In the early church, the book of Acts, we see many of the same kind of offenses and divisions. I just named a couple. How about Paul and Barnabas? They, they broke up their ministry. They had a good band going, man. They had a good thing going, didn't they? And they broke it up, right? They broke up the band. Why? Because of one guy named John Mark, right? Paul said he's not faithful and Barnabas, they split over this very thing. Do you think maybe there's some bad attitudes involved with both Paul and Barnabas? I don't blame Barnabas, but I, don't, I blame them both. They both had a bad attitude about something. They weren't seeing eye to eye, but they allowed it to be such an offense they couldn't work together anymore. Yet God still used them both in ministry, did he not? Wow, it's amazing. But there can become a point where we get so, so offended that you, you are no good to the kingdom anymore until you get your heart healed. Somebody say amen. Oh, okay, practice that toe thing again. All right, it's getting hot in here. How about the uh, many times that Paul called other people out? He called out Peter. Paul never walked with Jesus for three and a half years. Paul didn't cut, cut a guy's ear off defending Jesus. Paul was persecuting the early church, locking people up and killing them. Yet Paul corrected many people throughout scripture. And I think sometimes maybe they took it as an offense. Amen. So many other places too. So I want to ask you a question. Who offends you the most? Don't say it out loud, by the way, please. Do not. <laughs> do not. I should have prefaced that question. Sorry. Who? In your heart, you can answer this. Or in your mind, you'll see pictures. Who offends you the most? And typically, it's those closest to us. A spouse, a family member, close family member, kids or parents. How about church? Hanging around us long enough, I promise you, you'll be offended. <laughs> I've been offended right here in this. I've been offended by people that I'm pastoring. I've been offended. I have. I'm not going to lie. Uh, some people have said horrible, horrible things about me. And I'm not just saying on Facebook, okay? People have said very horrible things about me <laughs> in the body of Christ. Hopefully not on Facebook, all right? We'll let the others do that. Relatives, friends, neighbors, and of course, of course, your enemies. But we kind of expect it from our enemies, don't we? And uh, we get offended by everyone around us, if you think about it. If you've never been offended by a family member, that's pretty special. If you're married, you've never been offended by your spouse, that's pretty special too. If you've never been offended in church, I don't know how. <laughs> So we all love each other, right? But we're not always cloaked with Christ. Sometimes we put off the new man and put on the old man again. All right, we do. It's a choice. Forgiveness is a choice, it's not a feeling. I'm gonna say it again. Forgiveness is a choice, it's not a feeling. Well, I feel like I should forgive. No, it's a choice. Will you? Simply, will you obey? Will you obey? By choosing to let go of past hurts and embracing forgiveness, one can experience peace, which Jesus spoke twice over his disciples. Peace, peace, restoration, and a deeper walk with God. However, if you don't forgive, if you hold on to bitterness, if you stay offended, you really can't walk deeper with God because you're walking contrary to his spirit and his will. Amen? Amen. When we choose not to extend forgiveness, when we choose not, whose choice is it? When we choose not to, for, to extend forgiveness, we inadvertently trap ourselves into a state of prison and torment and anguish. In fact, it's a self-imposed prison. You are locking yourself up in a prison. You don't need the enemy's help. Just stay offended at somebody. And you just hand the keys over to the devil is what you're doing. It drains you mentally, emotionally, and physically. It really does. Being offended, you think you're protecting yourself. You think it's about self-preservation. Oh, by the way, God's trying to kill yourself. The very self you're preserving, get on board with God's plan. Plan A is God kills the self-nature inside of you. And he's got a way of doing it, and it hurts, and he uses everybody in this room to do it. Amen. Hopefully not everybody, but at least a few. 
That is that iron sharpening iron. And Peter did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is why he was offended of Christ. All of you will be offended, scandalized by me this very night. No, I won't. Come on, you know the story. Yes, you will. In fact, you're going to deny me three times. No, I won't. Because he was offended of Jesus. That's what it says. Wow. I'm willing to die with you and even go to prison with you. No, he didn't. But he didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of him yet. And I'm telling you right now, that is one of the, that's the game changer in the New Covenant, the New Testament, is that we can have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit inside of us to give us the power to die to that self-nature, amen? And we need it. We need it because we have too many negative emotions and all these things that hinder us, takes away our inner peace and robs us and consumes us, amen? Amen, so it is a choice, amen? Everybody say it's a choice. So overcoming offenses. Why is it something we seem to know all about, but we practice so little? I mean, if I asked you to give me some verses or some examples of being offended in scripture, I just gave you a few and you all nodded because you knew those stories already. Why is it we know so much about it, but we practice it so little? How many times are, offenses, are our offenses really the result of a misunderstanding rather than just a blatant attack by someone who says they love us? I'm gonna go out on a, on a limb here and say that I'll bet you most of your offense that you have or the unforgiveness that you have in your heart is based upon a perception or a misunderstanding rather than somebody just being cruel and mean to you all the time. Especially if it's somebody you love, a friend, a family member, a spouse. Now, an enemy on the other hand, they're cruel, amen? They will do all sorts of nasty things and still the Bible tells us in Matthew 5 how we're supposed to treat them. We're not gonna go there today. This message is already hard enough, right? How many times is it just a misunderstanding? We gotta start seeing through other people's lenses, the other person's lenses. Do you really think they said that thing that offended you because they're like, I just cannot wait to tear Dave Thompson down. Oh, I cannot wait. I'm gonna say this to Dave, he has it coming and Dave needs it and I'm gonna tear Dave down because that's in my heart to tear him down. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm gonna give you the microphone. <laughs> Well-timed, well, there's a kid, there you go. Reconcile, right there. Listen, I don't think that's what you want to do to me and I, I, I know my heart, I don't wanna do that to you. I'm not here to tear you down, make you miserable. That's not, that's not my purpose. I know that's not in my heart. So if I do offend you, it's probably a misunderstanding or my heart wasn't to offend you. Like even preaching this message, you can walk out of here offended. I'm not trying to offend him. I'm actually trying to tell you how to get over it. And somebody might walk out that door. I hated that sermon. I offended with Pastor Jim. Okay, well, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just trying to put the truth out there, amen? amen? How many times is it a misunderstanding, a misapplication of truth, or your perception is off? Because your perception will always become your reality. And then you lock in. I mean, you lock in on that reality. No, you said this, and I know you meant this. You really think that's in my heart? If we would start judging the intent of someone's heart instead of just the words on the surface, it'll, it'll keep us out of a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. Come on, someone say amen. amen. So look at the motive and look at the intentions and judge those. And I know that we don't always know the motive of everybody's heart. God alone knows all the motive, but don't think so badly of one another. Seriously, don't think so bad. And if it could be option A or option B, and one's far more, I don't know what the word is, far more damning than the other, right? To your relationship, give them the benefit of the doubt. No, seriously, write that down. Give them the benefit. I think they probably, it came off this way, but they probably meant it this way. Well, then go this way. No, I really meant to hurt you. Okay, well, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be at a loss if you, if you just think better of somebody, okay? You're not. I really believe that God wants us to choose that, I'll call it the path of least resistance because I believe more times than not, that's really what it's all about. But no, 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 we choose to be offended. It is a choice, amen? Eight things being offended is, write this down, eight things, here we go. This is not out of a book or anything. Uh, this is just something that I just felt like there, I had eight points, okay, that I came up with here. And so these are not in the King James version, but King J's versions. All right, here we go. <laughs> being offended is, that's gonna be the starting statement each time here. Number one, being offended is 
Easy. Super easy. Piece of cake. It's so easy to be offended. We are way too easily offended and it shows way too often. It's easy to misperceive. It's, e it's easy to misunderstand. And it's easy to defend yourself. It's your default mode. Amen. Number two, being offended is typically one-sided. Again, it goes back to your perception. In other words, it's, and this is, this is, in leadership, we say this all the time to one another, you have to always get both sides of the story. So if Nicole comes to me and she's, uh, ratting out Adam and what Adam did to Nicole, all right? And Nicole's telling me all these things about Adam. I'm like, oh man, Adam, that's horrible, man. Well, I'm gonna go blast Adam for you. Can't believe he treats you so poorly, Nicole. See, I, whoever speaks first seems to be right. That's a proverb. And I know that she seems right. I don't think she's like lying to me. You're not lying to me, are you? Oh no, all right. So I, I trust but, but her perception or her misperception or misunderstanding is probably woven into the story. Also, her emotions and her hurts are woven together as part of her story as she tells me. And I have to pick through all that and say, well, I know Adam's a good guy and he sounds like Elvis. <laughs> so it can't be, she's got, it can't all be right. Nicole can't be, I mean, I'm not saying she's lying to me, but that's how she feels. And, and, I, and I validate that that's how she feels. Nicole, that's how you feel. I get that, okay? Could there be a misunderstanding? The answer is probably always yes. So then if I come blasting at him, ah, you did this to Nicole, guns are blazing, right? Don't you ever do that again kind of thing. And he's like, whoa, with bolt holes all in him. What did I do? I, I didn't mean it that way. Here's what I said now. And I got to apologize to my brother because I hit him with a Gatling gun, amen, of truth. Da, 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 da. No, I have to go to him and say, listen, here's what I was told. Tell me your side of the story. When he tells me, I'm like, oh, I, I get it. Okay, all right. That makes a whole lot more sense. Now we bring the parties together and we deal with this thing. But we ought to be able to bring the parties together just mano a mano, shouldn't we? Isn't that the first stop? The first stop is go to the one, Right? But if we have to get involved, I have to always be careful when I hear one side that I don't take one side without going to the other and hearing that side first. Otherwise, I will have egg on my face, I promise. Everybody in leadership knows this story because you've probably been guilty of it. So again, it's typically one-sided. Go get both sides of the story. Number three, being offended is self-seeking by its very nature. It's an ego booster. You're boosting your, you have an ego problem. I want to hear quotes, your ego is not your amigo, <laughs> right? Yeah, I wrote that one down to you. That was a good one. Listen, it's all about your ego. It's self-seeking. It's self-serving because offense puts self at the forefront. You're offended. God's offended by the breach of relationship. You're offended with one another, but God's offended that you don't iron these things out. So don't let it be one side and understand you know what? I know they're mad at me about something. I, you know, we're not really on the same page right now, but let's go work this thing out in a spirit of reconciliation. That's my, my heart has to be that. It has to be. There's no really other, there's no other, I mean, there are, there's other options, but the other options are horrible. They're not good. They're not God. Number four, being offended is a normal human response that requires a spiritual kingdom reaction. I'm gonna say that again. Being offended is a normal it's normal. It's a normal human response. It is a response that requires a spiritual kingdom reaction. So which way are you gonna go here? You're gonna rely on that normal human response, that trigger. Come on, we're all trigger happy right here. When you're offended, you get real trigger happy and you just wanna pull the trigger quickly and deal with people. That is not what we do. That's not what Jesus demonstrated. It's not what I see in scripture. In fact, even when he set the Pharisees straight, right? And the Sadducees and the chief priests and the lawyers, I think, it, I think he took the long road there. I don't think it was like the first time that they came out of me, he's like, ah, you know, I'm gonna get you back. Put the vipers, you know? I think he got there on the installment plan. It took him a while to get there. I think he had to wait for his moment, amen? 
It's a normal human response that requires a spiritual kingdom reaction. So we want to lean in to the Father on this, amen? You need to be a spiritual person to overcome offense. You can't do it by reading self-help books. Somebody say amen to that. Number five, being offended is immature. It's super immature. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter three, a very familiar passage. And we'll start reading the first three verses. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people. Oh, by the way, that was the last solution, right? Spiritual. But as carnal or human or fleshly babies in Christ. So I couldn't speak to you as spiritual grown-up adults. I had to speak to you like a little baby. Paul wrote this in a letter that got read in front of the whole church. Let's try that sometime. Let's try that sometime. I fed you with milk, not with solid food. You couldn't take it. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even right now, you're still not able to take solid food. You're still sucking on a milk bottle. Y'all, Corinthians, that's what he's saying. Holy smokes, he wrote that. They read that. Verse three, you are still worldly, carnal, human nature. How do I know that? Because there's still envy and strife and divisions among you. Are you not still carnal and behaving like mere mortals or mere men? Woof, just seriously, woof. That's a gut punch if it ever was one. Being offended is immature. Well, we're all gonna get offended, but it's how you deal with it. I can't help but get offended sometimes, but how do I deal with it? Do I give them the benefit of the doubt? Do I take it to the Lord? Do I go to the person? Or I just go gossip about it everywhere else because that's what Corinth was doing. Envy, strife, bitter gossip got sewn in there. I told 10 friends before I went to the person, show me that in the Bible. I mean, show me where it's taught in the Bible. It happened in the Bible. You can show me that, but show me where that's taught in the Bible. Oof. This is good. Jump down to verse 16, 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? Now he takes it to where you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Don't you know what you're doing here? And if you're the temple of God, you ought to think things through differently. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? It's holy and it's set apart. And the Bible says, be holy as your father in heaven is holy. And here we are by our gossip slander being offended, which they, again, very much, the first three verses of this chapter, he's saying, you're the temple of God. This ought not happen. You're defiling your very temple, the very temple of God, when you're easily offended. You don't deal with things the way you're taught. How are your toes feeling right now? Good? <laughs> Let's move on. Number six. Being offended is a reaction that is way too frequent. In other words, something that we do too much of. We're easily offended and we're often offended. Put it that way. It's easy and it's often. Check yourself on this. If you're easily offended all the time, then maybe you're just too thin-skinned. You ever think about that? or maybe just too immature, like the Corinthian church. It doesn't mean you don't have hope. It just means you need to start obeying the word of God, period. All right, move on. Number seven, being offended is a sign of a lack of love. Mm. And love is part of the fruit of the spirit. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. We all know this one. Every single wedding. Verse four and following, listen to what it says here. Love suffers long, it's long suffering. Love is kind, it does not envy. Love does not parade itself around, it's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely, but when we're offended, what do we do? So if you're, if you're behaving rudely because you're offended, you are not in love. You're not, you're not in God. You're operating out of your fleshly Human nature, that human reaction or human response that needs a spiritual reaction. 
It doesn't behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not selfish. It's not provoked easily. It doesn't think evil. It doesn't think the worst about someone. It thinks the best about someone. Oh man, that's good. That's what it's saying. It doesn't think the worst of the person. It thinks the best of the, it gives them the better option. It gives them the benefit of the doubt. That's what love does. Oof. So the question really is, it's not, are you offended? It's, are you in love? Are you, do you have love, the love of God in your heart? It doesn't require, uh, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. Or there's proud, you know, we, we understand that this is, it, it goes on and on, talks about all these things, but love never fails. The power of love, amen? So again, it's a sign of lack of love. Go down to verse, um, verse 11. When I spoke as, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. You know one of the childish things Paul put away? Being easily offended. He's talking about love. And when I walk in perfect peace and love, I cannot. It's impossible to be easily offended. Sure, I'm sure there were offensible things that came across Paul's path the rest of his ministry. But when he walked in love, he said, listen, I'm not gonna talk like a baby anymore. I'm gonna talk like a grown man. I'm not gonna receive offense. I'm not gonna promote offense. In fact, I'm gonna teach you against offense and how to reconcile everything in love, amen? He says it's immature. Love is mature. Anything that's not love, all the things we just read that love is not. If you're any of those things, you're immature. This is the same letter, 1 Corinthians, is it not? He covered a lot of territory in that letter. Number eight, being offended is necessary. Now, you didn't think that was probably one of the answers, did you? It's necessary. All right, let's rock your world, ready? We need to develop kingdom character and kingdom character can only be developed by testing and trials and overcoming and perseverance and endurance. That's it. So offense is necessary. You have to be offended. Turn back two chapters to chapter 11. Yeah, we're still in 1 Corinthians, same letter. Verse 19, now I'm gonna read it to you out of three different versions. We'll start with the King Jimmy, ready? There must, sorry, James, King James. He's a king of England, guys. He wasn't all that holy. All right, anyways. <laughs> there must also be heresies among you. That's, now, I know that says factions. We'll come back to that in a second. But in the King James, it says, there must also be heresies among you that they which are approved of God may be made manifest among you. Now the new King James. There must also be factions among you. So heresies and factions, same word, that those who are proved may be recognized among you so that God can show, who, can recognize who the approved of God are. And finally, out of the New Living Translation, there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. Three words used in three different versions there. Heresies, factions, and divisions, there must be, it says, which tells me necessary to your spiritual development. Although we're not preaching about being offended and how to be offended and that we should be offended, it's going to come, amen. And it's necessary to test you. And who's going to offend you? All the people I just got on talking about. Spouse, family, friends, relatives, neighbors, enemies. They're all gonna take pot shots at you, amen? So this word for heresies and factions and divisions that are necessary or must be, this is what it says there. It's, uh, it's the uh, Greek word arisis, which means to, uh, the act of taking or capturing or storming a city. Weird. It's not what I thought it would have meant. The act of taking or capturing or storming a city. This must be amongst us? Sounds like war almost. It's also the act of choosing, choosing. You have, a, so factions are, I align with A or B. Political factions, Republican, Democrat. You get what factions are. They pit themselves against each other. And they butt heads against, so factions, heresies, divisions, 
something there where you have to choose sides. Catching this? So which side are you going to choose though? When the offense comes, which side will you choose? I hope you're gonna say the Lord's side because that is the answer. The Lord's side, being spiritual, being mature, not immature. Oh man, I was praying this morning that this word would not just be a good word or a word that you would just, you know, that was a good word, that it'd be an eternal word in your heart. I was praying this word would be an eternal word, that this forever changes who you are. That this word would get so deep inside of it, you can't, you can't, you know you can't be offended anymore. And you know that you can't be easily offended anymore. That it changes you from the inside out. Wow. It also means dissensions that arise from diversity of opinions. Boy, there's not a shortage of that in the world today. A diversity of opinions. Just ask anybody, they'll tell you. Amen. These are the things, heresies, divisions, and factions that are among you. They must be, why? Because God wants to prove his people. He wants people to recognize who the approved of God are. In other words, he wants to grow you up and display you because taste and see the Lord is good and they're gonna taste and see of you and me. I don't want them to taste bitter, but something sweet when they encounter me. Now, I know that some people may have it made up in their minds that Jason King will always be a bitter taste in their mouth, all right? I get it, okay? But I hope it's not you, <laughs> the people in this room, amen? Therefore, there's a godly purpose in divisions, in choosing sides, and even in the misunderstandings and the misperceptions. It's to show who is and who is not approved by God. In other words, this is something we're supposed to do. We're supposed to judge the fruit. Love is not, love is not, love is not. Love is, love is, love is. We know the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, generous, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. That's the fruit of the Spirit. If I encounter someone and I'm not hearing any of that stuff come out of their mouth, they're not walking in the Spirit. I didn't say you're not saved. That could be another option too, by the way. I'm saying you're definitely not walking in the spirit at least. At least you're not walking in the spirit. You're at least not putting on the new man. You're choosing the old default human nature. That's a choice. That's a choice. Someone say amen to that. So again, in 1 Corinthians 11, that same very chapter, not gonna go there, but the very beginning, you know what Paul says? The very first words he says to start that chapter off, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And then he tells us how to imitate him. He spends... The rest of the letter talking about how, how to imitate what he's doing. The gifts of spirit moving, love, etc. right? Imitate. Then let's follow the example of good people that have done that. You know what? Hang around people who are not easily offended. It's good advice, actually. If you hang around people that are easily offended, always torqued off about something, then you just, you know what? I probably, you, you too much time with them, you're going to be that way too. Amen. Lastly, how to overcome. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. How are we doing? Good, good. All right. I'm further in my notes than I normally am, so if this is a miracle, I'd man, hallelujah. <laughs> We're going to skip over the Beatitudes, but in Matthew chapter 5, there are six antitheses that Jesus speaks in this very chapter. Six antitheses. You've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said in the old, but I say. Six times, here's one of them. Just gonna give you one. You can look at all the six there and see how you're doing, by the way. It'll make you feel really warm and fuzzy on the inside. Verse 22. Um, but I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without call shall be in danger of judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of, of the council. And whoever says fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift, your sacrifice to the altar, and then you remember that your brother has something against you. Let's just stop right there. Your gift, your offering, your sacrifice. Maybe your sacrifice of praise. We walk in here at 10 a.m., music is rolling, amen? We're worshiping God and you're offering up the sacrifice of praise. The calve of your lips, you're beginning to lift up to God. If you remember that your brother has ought against you, stop. Big fat stop sign right there. Stop. Who's your brother? 
we're not gonna go back to the Good Samaritan. We all know, right? Who's your brother? Who's your neighbor? Well, certainly everybody in this room. It's a family member sitting right next to you. It's certainly a guy, a lady you work with or work beside at work. You know they have something against you. This, listen, I know it's usually taught when you're offended, you ought to go to somebody. True, very true. This says, doesn't say that this person's offended, does it? It says, you know that they're offended with you. Well, if they're offended with me, they should come to me. I don't 100% disagree with that. I get that because if you're offended, you should go. But this says, if you find out, if you know, if someone tells you that somebody's offended with you, that you stop bringing your gift, your sacrifice to the altar, and you go. Verse 24, leave your gift before the altar, go your way, and first, everybody say first. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Whoo. You leave it all there and go reconcile with somebody. This is important, super important. Listen, I cannot determine how you're going to react to me. I can only determine my own reaction. I've said this over and over again. I only get to determine how I react, how I behave. Don't let others and their response dictate back to you. That's weak Christianity. People come in, they got a bad attitude. Change the atmosphere or just join in with them. No, change the atmosphere. Again, you can't control how others treat you, but you can control how you respond when they treat you this way. That's up to you. It's a choice. You get to dictate this. You get to determine this. You get to determine the condition of your heart, not somebody else. Outside forces should not determine my response. It certainly does play a part in that, but then it's a test. It's a test. And man, you will get tested. You will get tested, amen? So always approach relational friction. All right, this is so good. Always approach a relational friction with a spirit of redemption and reconciliation. Redemption and reconciliation. Listen, it takes grace to do this. Ask for it. Ask for the grace to do it. So what is redemption? To be redeemed. The prefix re means back or again, R-E, back or again. The word deem, the Latin word demir means to buy or purchase. It's where it comes from. So to again or go back to purchase or buy something. To buy back and repurchase again. That's what redeem means, redemption. The kinsman redeemer of the book of Ruth, right? To purchase back what was lost, Go in a spirit of redemption where you repurchase, rebuy back peace between you as brother or sister in Christ. That's what you're doing. Go in a spirit of redeeming and repurchasing. Everybody got that? Kinsman redeemer. Because Jesus is the ultimate redeemer, amen? But what does he want us to do? The same thing. He's the savior, but he wants us to be saviors in this world. He's the redeemer, but he wants you to redeem too. He's the great reconciler. Does he expect that of you and I? You bet he does. The word reconciliation or reconcile, again, prefix, re, back or again. Conciliar, and uh, it's, it's it's a Latin word as well, which means counsel or to make friendly or to, again, bring together, right? Two alienated parties coming to peace with one another. To reconcile means to bring back again to make friendly again, to make peace again, to bring back together. This is what God wants. So he wants the repurchasing and to bring back together, reconcile, bonded together. And we're warned even. Show Proverbs 18, 19. An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. It's Proverbs 18, 19. Oof. An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. 
If it's so hard, then why are we called to it? He does not call us to the easy tasks. What he calls us to is hard. But if your heart is softened, come on, go back to that waterfall cascading down the mountain, softening the hard cracks and crevices and rocks that are in our heart. If you'll let the anointing of God pour over you and soften your heart, then you won't be easily offended. Or if you are offended, it won't be so hard to win you back. Don't be the person that it's impossible to win back. Come on. Don't be the person that's harder than a fortified city to win back, redeem, repurchase, reconcile with. Don't be that person. Open your heart up. I know, I get it, it's hard. You're gonna have to get over some stuff. Well, get over yourself. And reconcile. Listen, I'm gonna end with these things here. I'm I'm gonna read some scriptures here in a moment and put it on perspective. We need to become thick-skinned and hard to offend. If you're gonna leave here with anything, leave with this challenge. You need to become thicker skin. I'm called alligator skin. Here we are in the jungle, amen, hallelujah. Welcome to the jungle. (laughs) Crocodile, alligator skin, you need to have a tough hide. If you're so easily offended, you don't have a tough hide. You don't have gator skin. You need to develop that and you need to ask God to help you develop. I'm not saying to have a hard heart, I'm just saying be tough skinned. That's all right, I know they they don't mean it. (laughs) That's all right, I I choose not to be offended. They They just misunderstood what I meant. That's the way you have to respond. That's all right. I'm not going to let it get to me. I don't care what they say about you. I don't care what memes they make about you. (laughs) Don't go into politics if you're thin-skinned. I'm telling you right now. Y'all laugh because y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't get so upset when they put you on HBO and mock you. It's all good. Serious. It's all good. I'm fine. People have asked me all the last couple of weeks, are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm, it's, all they're doing is they're bringing light to the situation. I had, someone had to say the words, amen? Someone had to tell what the perversion and stuff that's going on in our community and bring that to light to the state house. Yeah. Angie's doing a great job there doing those things and I was honored to be invited to do that. <laughs> someone had to say the stuff that was being done and I was willing to do that. And I don't care. It didn't bother me at all. I slept great. <laughs> family was asking, you okay? Yeah, I'm great. I'm fine. I choose not to be offended by that. I, I choose to understand that there are people that are captive by a lie th- that right now, today, they still have a chance. On this side of eternity, they still have a chance. How do I know that they're not going to become the next Saul that turns to Paul? I don't know. But I'm going to keep praying for them. I'm going to keep doing what it says in Matthew 5, even though it's not easy to bless those who curse you, right? But I'm still going to do it because I'm commanded to, and I just let it all go to God. I let it all go, just let, let it all go to God, amen? And you'll, you'll be in a much better state. Become alligator skin or thick skin. Listen, it's a lifestyle choice that you have to make. It's a lifestyle. Forgiveness is both an act and a process. It's an act of forgiveness that you have to do it, but it's a process of walking through it over and over and over again. And probably something that's going to happen to your dying day is learning how to sow forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a one-time event. It's a continual journey of learning to be unoffendable. I don't know if it's a word, but we're gonna make it one today. It's a journey of becoming unoffendable. I mean, it's one thing when you've done something, you offended somebody and there's truth to it. It's another thing when you're falsely accused, that's taken care of in the Beatitudes. The last one, when they shall revile you, say all manner of evil against you, falsely. He says you're blessed. <laughs> Get plenty of opportunities to be blessed, amen. <laughs> Shandai, all right. There's false accusations, there's false narratives. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for your reward is great in heaven. I just focused on my eternal reward. That's all I gotta do. I'm good. I'm good, Lord, for your kingdom and your sake, amen? If you are looking for offense, you will find it. That is a principle I have learned in, this is 24, so 21 years now of being an elder in this church, I have learned that principle over and over again. If someone is looking for offense with the leadership, they will find it. 
It may not be accurate, but they will find it. Don't look for offense. My goodness. Your eyes are on the wrong thing. Every minute you take looking at the wrong thing, you're sacrificing looking at the right thing, which is him. And listen, don't hold up God's intentions for your life. Otherwise, we subject ourselves to this perpetual cycle of bitterness and resentment and offense and unforgiveness. God wants to break this nasty cycle that's in our life, amen? That trap we keep falling into, we keep being lured in, that bait that Satan keeps putting out there, we'll continually be uh, bound up by the past and by the people in our lives. And I don't wanna be bound anymore. So don't hold on to offenses, amen? I'm gonna close with two passages. Go to James 3 real quick. I'm not gonna read it all. I planned on it, but I'm not going to. I want you to read James 3 on your own. But James 3 talks about, again, uh, there's not many teachers because we receive the greater judgment, but we all stumble in many things. He says, uh, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, verse two. Verse three, we put hor- you know, bits in horses' mouths to make them obey, right? And he talks about the tongue, the power of the tongue, and it's a little rudder and it steers the ship. Verse five, even so the tongue is a little member that boasts great things. And see how great of a forest that little fire can kindle? It just takes a spark and you can light an entire forest on fire. The tongue is a fire, verse six, right? It warns about these things. Verse eight says, no man can tame the tongue. And so we're going to offend one another, especially when we're not in the spirit and we're walking in our flesh. It's gonna happen. With it, we bless God and then we also curse men. He's not telling you to do this, bless God and curse men. He's not saying that, but that's what we do. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. It ought not be so. It ought not be so. Do the spring send both fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? Verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Meekness is not weakness. In fact, meekness is strength. Blessed are the meek. They inherit the earth. Verse 14, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking, things he warned about in 1 Corinthians 3, right? And if it's in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth or don't cover it up. This wisdom does not descend from above. It's earthly, it's sensual, and it's demonic. Woof, another one. Thank you, Jesus. And where there's envy and self-seeking and they exist, There's confusion in every evil thing. Oh, man. Guys, you hearing this? This is the heart of being offended and unforgiving and holding a grudge. But, everybody say but. We got got an answer. The wisdom that does come from above, and I want you to really meditate on this passage. I don't have time to go through it. It's first pure. It's without mixture. It's not mixing your humanity and your spiritual life together. No, it's pure. If it comes from God, if it comes from above, you're walking the spirit. You don't have to worry about the human reaction. You have the spiritual answer. It's pure. It's peaceable. Jesus said peace twice. Why? There wasn't peace. It's gentle. These are fruits of the spirit. It's willing to yield. It's full of mercy and good fruits. Just throw in all the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5 there without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace or reap a harvest. Those who are peacemakers will reap a harvest of righteousness. And lastly, Colossians 3, verses 12 through 15 says this. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy, set apart, temple of God, and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, man. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. You must also, you must. But above all things, put on what? Love. Love, which is the bond of perfection and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful, let's all stand. Let the scriptures speak for themselves. I wanna encourage us with these words today. This might be one you need to go back and listen to again. 
eternal perspective and eternal change will come into your heart if you allow this word to really sink in. Father, we go with that blessing of God. We go with that command to love one another, to do as Jesus do, to did as, do, uh, as, as Paul said, imitate me to do. Lord, we will do what you said to do. We will follow after you. We'll get thicker skinned by your grace, not by our works, but by your grace. We'll become the unoffendable people that you want us to be in the kingdom of God. Putting each other first, putting others in front of our own self, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen.